Good morning. Today's lesson is entitled John the Baptist. And we are looking at references from Luke 3, verses 1 through 20, and John 1. This is sort of an interesting lesson, I think. It's a little different than the lessons we have been having. What we're talking about is the difference between good and bad news. One of the questions that arises is, when is bad news good? And when is good news bad? I really have thought about that quite a bit. And I think that the bad news, when it is good, has brought about positive change in our lives, uh, redirecting us from evil ways. Good news turning bad, that's sort of interesting also. I think that has more of a reference to entire systems. You know, we live in a world of systems. Just think about that. We have abusive systems that can arise from issues with governmental agencies, educational agencies, social agencies, and legal in, in <laughs> agencies. How do we bring about change? Well, we decide that one or more of these systems is not headed in the right direction. And our opportunity then, <clears throat> excuse me, is to leave the system. We know what is right and what is wrong in most instances, and we need to have the courage to make the changes in our life. We need to pray and to listen and to have the courage to make a move. The ministry of John uh, really was one where he was trying to move people away from complacency and participation in wicked systems. He called the people to repent, to restitution by bearing good fruit. God calls us to do the same. We must repent and ask God to lead us forward. Jack, I think you're going to read the yeah, lesson. I am going to read scripture. It's uh, taken from the third chapter of Luke. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness, he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah, he says, those words being the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. As the people were filled with expectations and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them saying this, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in the hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary, but the chaff will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he, John the Baptist, 
proclaim the good news to the people. So, Barbara, good fruit in the wilderness. Let's hear about it. Okay. The first verse of Luke 3 is not included in our scripture today, but it deals with the power and order. Caesar ruled the world. Pilate ruled Judea. Herod, Hannibus ruled in Galilee and Perea. Philip ruled northeast of Galilee, and Carpus ruled as high priest with his father-in-law, Arius, the disposed former priest, counseling him. The Romans, the Imbanites, and Jews divided their political, military, and religious control. Despite all this power that Luke describes as residing in the grand building, in grand buildings like palaces, forests, and temples, God's word did not come to any of these leaders. Instead, God's word came to a man in the wilderness, John, son of Zachariah and Elizabeth. John expressed that word as a call to repent. He gave a lengthy and aggressive speech to the people who had made the difficult journey to the wilderness to see him. He stated that their and ancestors and community participation were not enough. They needed to bear the fruit of repentance. The axe was already at the roots of the trees that produced evil fruit. The people did not argue or try to rationalize their behavior once they hear John's proclamation they were part, that, that they were part of the trees bearing the evil fruit. Instead of justifying themselves, or blaming others, they asked what they should do. John was completely honest with them and gave them straightforward and concrete answers. One of the things he stressed mostly was to the tax collectors not to collect or exhort from people more than they would do. This exhorts, this taking the money to this pile to cease economic oppression of those with less power was John's preaching of the gospel. Among other things, Jesus frames his ministry as bringing good news to the poor. The author of our lesson states John shared the same understanding that if it ain't good enough, good news to the poor, it ain't the gospel. John insists that the coming Messiah will separate the wheat from the chaff. The useful will be gathered into the barn and the worthless will be burnt away. These words are great news. Each work, and perhaps more often when we pray to God do for the will, his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, that can be a dangerous prayer. We probably will need to have to make some serious changes, less judging, more service and help to others, thinking of others more than we think of ourselves, to name just a few. One of the serious changes that John called for was for Herod Anibus to repent of marrying his brother's wife, Herodus, who was niece to both of them. Herod Anibus had no intention in changing his ways. Instead of repenting, he had John arrested to silence him. And then later on, as we hear the story, he finally had him beheaded at the request of a niece. So the author asks us, how is the gospel good news to the poor? And I think it's pretty simple answer. Regardless of our economic status, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins and to give eternal life. That is good news for everyone, the poor, the middle class, the wealthy, all of us are the same in God's eyes. Okay, very good, Barbara. Thank you. Betsy, will you continue our lesson? We are going to talk about getting ready for God. The people came out of the wilderness to be baptized. From their history, the people were intimately familiar with the concept of bathing to wash away impurity. Think about the lives of the people. First of all, they had been in the wilderness and there was no way for them to be cleansed. They walked on the streets, on the roads. They were not clean. They must be pure and clean to enter the temple. John's baptism would allow people to encounter God in their very 
lives, not just in the temple. The Holy One would come to them in their hour of need. John announced that the Messiah would come to them. Baptized, baptism would remove sin itself. And it was with that, that God would enter each individual. He is at hand. And to get them ready for the Messiah, John the Baptist did baptize for what would come that God would live in each of us. Okay, thank you, Betsy. Well, what does this lesson have for us? What is our takeaway personally today? You know, one of the vexing situations of the Christian church down through the ages is what is the role of an individual in the process of salvation? One tenet that all branches of Christianity uh, agree on is this. To become a Christian, one must truly repent of their sins. So the next question is, how do we really repent? It would be nice if we could go out into the desert, interview John the Baptist, and ask him that question. What do we really mean? What do you mean by repentance of sins? But we know that's not possible. The best answer is that when we accept Christ into our lives, the Holy Spirit enters into our lives. It has the power to convict us of our sins and to lead us to true repentance. I've long thought that a Christian knows right from wrong in most situations. Uh, I have uh, certainly agreed to that in my own life. I think the Holy Spirit is our conscious cloak, if you will. It is telling us when we're getting ready to sin and get in trouble with God. If we listen to the Holy Spirit instead of the outside forces, which are usually Satan related, we veer away from committing a sin. That doesn't mean we're sin free, not by any means. Life's a constant battle, I think, between good and bad in our lives. But fortunately, you know, the good news is that our Lord will forgive our sin when we truly repent of it. Then there is the concept of the omission, omission of sins, which is somewhat hard to define. But there are sins that occur when we neglect as Christians to do the right thing to our fellow man. Betsy was alluding to that in her comments. I think that we must pray earnestly that we will, God will open our hearts through the Holy Spirit and that we will recognize what a Christian response is to the sin of omission and work to right the wrongs of society as we see them in front of us. So Barbara, with that, uh, those comments, would you close us with prayer? Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time together. Please let us be able to hear your voice when you are speaking to us and letting us know if we're doing anything to take away the gospel when people see our, see our actions and hear our words. Please help us to treat everyone the same. And to remember, Jesus came for everyone, not just the people that we deserve for eternal life. Thank you for this season of celebrating our Savior. And please forgive us when we do forget the reason for the season. Be with each and every person during this holiday season. Be with the people who have lost loved ones. Be with the ones who are grieving. Be with the ones who wonder where the next meal is going to come from. And God, thank you so much for loving us all the same. Be with each and every person. Have the will in, your, in their life. And God, please help us to accept the will and give us the guidance and peace and strength to do what you would have us to do both for ourselves and for others. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Thank you. Yes. Everybody have a good week. See you.